Welcome everybody to Clearwater Jazz Holidays Young Lions Jazz Master Virtual Sessions. Today's educator and guest musician is Brandon Robertson and his topic today is tempos and styles, how to build endurance for performance. As a reminder, we are recording these sessions for the purposes of Clearwater Jazz Holiday Education and Outreach. Everybody is muted right now for the courtesy of the session, but if you use the chat feature, we will be sure to get those questions to Brandon, and we can even unmute you if you want to have a dialogue with him. If you like this session and want to see uh, other sessions, um, please go to clearwaterjazz.com forward slash education. That's our education and outreach page. We have wonderful sessions and amazing musicians and educators working with us on this. We have these things scheduled well into July with more added often. If you would like to give us feedback about any of these sessions or suggested topics, please email those to info at clearwaterjazz.com and we will take a look at those. So let me tell you a little bit about Brandon and turn it over to him. Uh, Brandon is an Emmy-nominated music director, director, professional, upright, electric bassist, composer, and music educator originally from Tampa. He completed his Bachelor of Arts in Music from Florida State University in 2009 and a Master of Music and Jazz Studies in the spring of 2016. Currently, Brandon is the Director of Jazz Studies and Director of the Florida Gulf Coast University Basketball Band at Florida Gulf Coast University in Fort Myers. He is now an honorary member of the Kappa Kappa Psi Mu Upsilon Chapter at Florida Gulf Coast University. In 2018, Brandon was nominated for an Emmy Award for Best Documentary for Educational Collegiate Programs featuring the Florida Gulf Coast University Jazz Ensemble. As a prominent band leader, Brandon has taken his band on multiple national tours, headlining at some of the top jazz venues in the country. To add to his impressive resume, Brandon has performed with notable acts such as the world-famous Count Basie Orchestra, led by director Scotty Barnhart. Brandon has uh, been a featured performer and a band leader at various national jazz festivals, including his headline debut at the Jacksonville Jazz Festival, Tampa Bay Jazz Festival, and others. And recently, Brandon released his first debut album entitled Based on a True Story <laughs> in, the in the fall of 2019, which reached all the way to number 16 on the iTunes Top 200 release. That's awesome. So uh, we thank our many sponsors and supporters for expanding the reach of of these sessions, including the Al Downing Tampa Bay Jazz Association and others. Brandon, thank you for being a part of this. Your other sessions have been wonderful, and we hope you, we can keep you around for a while. So welcome. Uh, the stage is all yours, my friend. Well, good afternoon to everyone that's uh, here in our session today. Good to see everybody. And for those who will be uh, viewing this later on, um, in the archives. Again, my name is Brandon Robertson. And for today's session, we're going to talk about something that I think is not only important uh, for all the musicians, but primarily and specifically for bass and drummers, bass players and drummers. Um, the, one, the one thing that I learned uh, about when I was on the road touring, especially when I performed with the bassy band, was you have to have a you have to be in pretty good shape not not necessarily saying that you know being out of shape won't hinder you from from doing your job but you have to have when i say you have to be in shape you have to be mentally in shape to endure being on the road switching from city to city changing venues that have different setups climate changes in different regions of the country there's all these variables that 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 play that that plays into the way you perform when you're on stage. <clears throat> the first time that I went out and toured, and this was actually a, I would consider this a tour. Some people might think any differently, but um, I worked on a cruise ship. I worked on Princess Cruise Line uh, for four months, and I had the honor and the pleasure of working on the Grand Princess, which went to Europe. So I was in Europe for four months 
got to visit 23 countries the time that I was over on the ship. I also met a legendary pianist by the name of Ray Cousins, who um, was probably one, of, I think he was, believe, I believe he was one of the last remaining accompanists uh, with, for Frank Sinatra before Frank had passed. And so one thing that Mr. Cousins taught me or that time or the time we was on the ship was he said two things. He says, you need to learn how to play the long, the, the long gated gigs. And at the time I didn't understand what he meant by that, but he said, when you get asked to play for four hours, you're playing at least two and a half hours of that time frame. You know, usually when you play long gigs like that, um, you, you have a longer break, but you're playing much longer sets in the time frame. So I played in the wheelhouse and he was in he was in the main uh, he was in the main bar lounge that was down that was on the deck below, which was like the open area. That was like the big that had a huge, beautiful Steinway piano. It was beautiful. So I played in the wheelhouse and I only was required to play for an hour and a half. Uh, Monday through Saturday, we had off Sunday. Uh, Ray, however, he played all seven nights a week, and these were four-hour gigs he would be playing at a time. And I would go there on my breaks, or I would go there after I would play my show, and I would go down there to the lounge, and I would watch him. And he's solo piano. So imagine playing for four hours straight of solo piano. That means you have to know a whole lot of literature and you have to be very flexible. You have to be a chameleon when you work on a cruise ship because you're going to meet so many different type of passengers and they're going to request a multitude of different music. So if you only have capsized yourself into one genre and have been stuck in that area for, for a long time and someone throws another song at you that you that you probably have heard of, but you've never performed it kind of discredits you in some way because they're like, oh, musicians are everybody, they know everything. Yes to no. <laughs> we may know all the same music, but that doesn't necessarily mean we've actually performed it. So it was, I learned a valuable lesson watching Mr. Cousins and what he taught me. And he always used to say, you have to be mentally, you have to, you have to be uh, mentally fit, you know, physically like fitted to, to, to handle those kind of situations. So, my first point is um, understanding the type of gig you'll be performing. So if you're playing, for instance, uh, you're at a wedding, right? Most weddings, the band had to be there like for 12 hours, which I still don't know why to this day. <laughs> We're always there for as long. They need us there before the ceremony starts and all that. It's like, why? And while, And then you end up either playing the cocktail hour and the reception and the ceremony. So that if you add all the hours in there, that's about four or five hours that you're playing. And if you're playing for a wedding, the groom and the bride, they have requests. Their parents might have requests. And then their guests might have requests. So now you're having to cater to three different types of groups. Okay. The main people who are paying you, the people who provided the money, to give to you to get paid and then everyone else that's there to enjoy the entertainment. And so I learned over time, you know, playing wedding gigs that you have to be a chameleon. You have to be able to, to stretch yourself and mentally stay in it the entire time. So um, my first point, what I like to get to is we're talking about tempos and styles because that's where I, that's why I started off with all of this and letting you guys know, how where how does how does all this tie in together number one listen to great rhythm sections not just in jazz but in general when you hear a great rhythm section play there's a type of energy that is in captured that you can't replicate because that energy is so intact that if you try to throw a curveball at it they are prepared at all times. So I wrote down my four all time great, or actually, sorry, I have five, five all great rhythm sections. Now, now I'm speaking in jazz because that's my area. My first one would be 
the Blakey rhythm section. So the cats that played with Blakey in the messengers. So you have um, Blakey himself. We also had Horace Silver, who was probably one of the original members. Um, Jimmy Merritt on bass, Reggie Workman on bass. I think about these classic records in the, 50, in the mid 50s that Blakey put out. You know, you got the Night of Tunisia, Cafe Bohemia, um, the Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers, Moaning. There's all of these classic records that, man, when you hear the, when you hear the horn players play against that rhythm section, it is so infectious. You're like, wow. And they can variate through different styles. Blakey was a, a, was a phenomenal stylist. In jazz, he would he could take like if you listen to his version of Invitation, I'll use that song for example, and you kind of having this kind of Afro Cuban feel, even though it's a slow four, but the feel that he's playing behind it changes the entire groove. It changed the way that the piano and the bass have to adapt. That's something that a great rhythm section can teach. You, that can teach you how to play in those situations where you're not, you don't have to always play everything in 4-4 four, four and it's swing, 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 right? The second greatest group rhythm section that I admire, the first, I call this the first generation of the Miles rhythm section players. So Red Garland, PC, Mr. Paul Chambers, and Philly Joe. Now, that rhythm section was super locked because their swing and their time would never fluctuate. And when you're talking about tempos, these guys, once they start, that tempo was set and it would stay there. And if it did move, it never went below where they originally started. It always got, it always went faster. Right. And when you listen to all those great uh, miles records, you know, like uh, I believe, Milestones is one of them. That's a classic one. Um, when you listen to the earlier uh, prestige records with like moaning, or not moaning, um, cooking, relaxing, working, steaming, all of those records, the, the rhythm, the, the, the rhythm section is so tight, like really, really tight. And you can't break that. You cannot break the, 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 the energy that's occurring there. And so I like to use that rhythm section as an example to my students in terms of what, what kind of feeling that you're supposed to get. Because whenever you play something fast, if you listen to how the rhythm section interacts with each other, the bass player is usually the one that's not necessarily trying to play a whole lot of notes, but with double notes just to keep the, the feel and the, and the pulse moving, right? The drums will play slightly looser in the ride cymbal, but will keep a very consistent motion in the, in the bass drum. So there's something that's constantly keeping that forward motion, right? And not to call out my piano players, I love you guys, I love all of you, but when you start, when you start speeding up tempos, piano players play less notes. Sometimes they'll just completely drop out <laughs> if they don't know what's happening. They're like, wait, hold up, what's going on here? And that's why I, that's why I use the example of this, this today's topic that to discuss about bass and drums because we can't stop. Once we start, we're, we're continuing to the very end. As a matter of fact, the bass player is probably the only member in the entire band that never stops from beginning to end because – or unless a drummer's taking a solo, that's the only time you get a break. But outside of that, if the drummer decides not to take a break, uh, take a solo, the bass player is still playing. We can't stop. So there comes an endurance that you have to build. So when you listen, when you listen and check out really great rhythm section players, you're listening for that. Like, how are they getting that endurance? What is it that the bass player is doing to not get winded? What is, what is the drummer doing stylistically to break it up, right? Sometimes you would hear PC and Philly would go into a two beat or Paul would be walking and all of a sudden now he go doom, 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 He's playing half notes, but Philly was still keeping time, but would do something differently on the kit to kind of break up the monotonous of just swing, 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 because it's so tense, right? That's why I really like that miles, that earlier miles, uh, 
rhythm section because they did a great job at breaking up whenever they would play faster tempos, they would break it up. Now, the next tier, my next rhythm section that I want to cover, uh, this one to me signifies what Miles, I, I assume, and I can't speak for Miles because he's not here, but if I had to guess as a listener, this was the group that kind of collectively brought it all together, what Miles was searching for and what he was pushing for in the 50s. And that is the second tier, the second wave of, of his rhythm section players, which would be Tony Williams, Ron Carter, and Herbie Hancock. And you have a 17-year-old, a 29-year-old, and a 21-year-old. So you have three generation gaps. And Miles knew that, right? So you had one kid who was just a firecracker on the drum set. You have an older rhythm section player who's already done been through some things. He's when I say been through some things, I'm talking musically. Like he's he's already been playing long enough to where he's gotten he's gotten some of experience under his belt. And then you have a 20-year-old, 21-year-old kid who's classically trained, who is now switching in another di a whole different mindset, right? So when you listen to that 64, 65 group of Miles, of Miles music with when he had Wayne Shorter part of the group, that rhythm section was in, in it was immaculate, man. Like the things that they were able to do in real time, and Miles would react in real time and adjust in real time what they were doing, right? Ron Carter, in an interview recently, they asked Ron about that time, and Ron said the greatest lesson I learned from playing Miles was that I never knew what to expect the next night. I never went into a gig expecting it to sound the same as it did the night before. And he said there were times where you would hear, you would hear Ron uh, you'll hear Tony playing all of these figures like ding 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 and as a bass player I would I would get frustrated sometimes when drummers do that because I'm like man why why are you changing the pulse man like keep it stop stop mess but then again when you start to grow and mature and you start to understand what your role is especially as a bass as bass and drummers you your job is to make it creative. Your job is to not make it sound staggering and boring. So sometimes if one of the two players, either the bass player or the drummer feels that way, they will start doing slightly different things in their playing. And if you play with a really good horn player, they'll catch it. And once they catch it, they say, oh, something is happening. Let's continue. Let's see where this goes. That's why I selected that particular rhythm section. Because if you listen to how Miles played in the 60s, it is completely different what he was doing in the, in the mid-50s. And how Miles would play very, I would like to say, um, introvertically in the changes, right? But in the 60s, where we started to become through the avant-garde and more modal, so we're breaking apart with a whole lot of chords and just hearing sounds and hearing the music, which is kind of why I think Kind of Blue is so successful. And I'm not taking away from that rhythm section with Bill and, and Jimmy Cobb, but that rhythm section that Miles got to in the 60s changed the way he played because now he can play a certain way and, and play what he's hearing, and he knows that in real time, this rhythm section is going to react. So in terms of stylistically, they created different meters and different entities within that group that Miles knew he would never get bored playing with those guys. And that's a very, that is a really great concept as a bass player and a drummer to think about. Like, what am I bringing to the table? Am I just, am I just going to be a, a record player or, you know, like a tape player, just hit press play and then that's it. That's it. That's all you, that's all, that, that's it. That's, I, I'm not doing nothing else. I'm just going to hold it down. But sometimes the horn players or whoever you're playing with, and even the piano player, they want you to do more than that. They actually want you to interact. We, they know that we are, we are, we are the chain to the bike, you know, so we're locking everything together. However, they still want us to, you know, do some tricks every once in a while because it, it, it just breaks up the feeling and it breaks it up. And so my, uh, my last, I have two more, but this one that I wrote down, my last rhythm section that to me really embodied 
feel. And their in the way in the way they would play their tempos was so connected that it was very hard to distinguish who was taking lead because they all simultaneously would do it all at once. And I'm speaking about my man, one of my favorite bass players, George Moreau on bass. Um, rest in peace to the late Richie Powell on piano and Max Roach. That rhythm section with Sonny and Clifford Brown, you you not gonna find something like that no more. <laughs> I, at least I haven't. And there's a lot of there's a lot of guys out here, uh, you know, Emmett Cohen. Like his trio is solid. Like that is that trio reminds me of that group. Just the way that they play together, it's so tight, and you can tell that they've played together for a long time. You could tell they were friends. You could tell that they actually genuinely loved each other as human beings, and it showed in their playing. So whenever they would take you know they would go back and forth you could feel this tug you know you could feel this tug that was happening right sunny uh sunny uh sunny rollins plus four man that's one of my favorite records um just because stylistically these guys the way they would they would fluctuate through the rhythm section it was it was amazing you know and my my again to my first point when you listen to great rhythm sections rhythm sections players you start to understand the, the the models that you can that you can extract from okay and the very last rhythm section who i didn't write down but it came to mind that i would be behavioral me if i did not speak about this which would be the oscar peterson trio when you take that trio with ray brown ed thickman and, and, and oscar when you listen to their arrangements stylistically i mean take let's take the record we get requests right so for you young you younger uh you youngsters out here that are going to be watching this I, your, your homework i give you your homework assignment listen to oscar peterson's album we get requests every song on that record is about max two and a half maybe three minutes each song they're not long and the story behind that record they went in there into the studio and did it in one take. I'm sorry. I don't know too many people that can do that. <laughs> like, and sound the way they did on that record, which speaks volume about how tight that rhythm section and that relationship was. Oscar played all these notes up and down the piano. But when you listen to Ray and Ed play together, they hold it down so simple. And they don't play a lot of, they don't play a lot of fancy stuff other than what they know how to do best. When you take every song on there, everybody that every every jazz arrangement I've heard of Have You Met Miss Jones has always been at a medium tempo. They slowed that song all the way down. I mean, 50 clicks. <laughs> you know how hard it is for a bass and drummer to stay swing that slow and still fit right in the pocket, right? But then you take uh, Imp Girl from Ipanema, their version of Girl from Ipanema, which they not only played it in not the original key, but played it in a key that on bass is very hard to play in, and then turned it into a bossa. And I mean, a really cool kind of bossa. Not a doom, ding, 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 ding. It's like kind of like a double time, but doom, da doom, da doom, da doom, da doom. And Ed Thickpin got one of the best bass drum kit pedal i've ever heard in my life <laughs> and that tight that rhythm section was so was they understood stylistically how they can they can invertly come out of something and then wind their way back in they always had the presence of swing but it never changed it never changed at all so i mentioned those five great rhythm sections uh that i that is just my five picks there's many more i i left out a lot but to me those were the ones that I remember studying when I was in school. And I just, that's what helped me fall in love with playing jazz because I was like, wow, these guys are really tight and they understand each other and they understand their role and different stylistically, they were able to do a lot of different things. Right. Which takes me to my point. Number two, listen to great records that has various styles. So uh, I use the first record, uh, Stan Getz and Gilberto. Right. That's probably one of his most that's probably one of Stan gets one of one of his most famous recordings. And they take the bossa nova sound 
and they variate it. So you have these dairy, this, these uh, different variations of Basa that was never introduced before, or at least not didn't have the kind of exposure that that record was able to put out. Um, you know, when you listen to records by Lee Morgan, uh, Horace Silver, Les McCain, Eddie Harris, when you listen to those guys, you know, I think about – the the boogaloo and uh, and the, what I like to call like the soul earlier soul jazz where you had influences of the rock you had the influences of the gospel you had influences of what we call earlier R and B and then jazz they kind of infused all that together it was Ray Charles would, I would also add him into that category these guys all stylistically were able to merge the music of that day of that era all in one that's why jazz is so flexible than other genres because we're able to extract all different influences and tie them in together so when you as a rhythm section player when you're exposed to those different kind of extractions it actually molds you into a more eclectic player you actually your mind will start to hear things and different influences that you probably didn't realize you know simultaneously like you were thinking about and it just kind of happened Right. Uh, if I had to take groups from like one of my favorite groups is the Weather Report, man. I love that group. That's like that, when you think of bass, you think you think of Jocko. That's 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 it. That's it. Right. And you also take Herbie and the Headhunters, you know, in that earlier, earlier 70s era when he finally when he finally mastered the roads and he was like, oh, yeah, this is fire. <laughs> I like this sound. And you get your records like Drifting. You get your records like Maiden Voyage or or Watermelon Man. You know, you get those kind of recordings. And stylistically, and I keep saying, I keep using that word style. Stylistically, you can still hear the jazz influence. It didn't, did nothing vary. Did nothing change. That's the, that was, that's the next point of my lesson. Or that's another point to point number two is, don't change who you are. You don't have to change the person. You're adapting. You're becoming adaptive to the environment. You don't have to change yourself to fit into what's happening. I see a lot of young musicians do that. They will sit there and they will force themselves to try to play like that. And like, no, don't do that. Just listen. Just listen to what's going on around you. And then think about things that you've heard or other music that you've listened to that kind of has a similar contrast. And that's what you're pulling from. You're just taking little bits of inf- musical ideas and information and you're trying to adapt it. It's like, it's, it's basically like you doing a puzzle, but you don't have all the pieces in front of you. So somebody will hand you a piece and then you'll try to put it into the puzzle. And it's like, Nope, that doesn't fit. That didn't work. Take that out. Get you another piece. Oh, uh-huh. Oh, that worked. You got another one? Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. And then eventually, by the end of the song, you're com- you've already completed it because now you've covered everything you needed, right? And so then after you listen to great rhythm sections, after you listen to great recordings of different styles, now, now mind you, everybody who's watching this, I keep using the word listen first. I didn't say go play, listen. Because you can't play something that you've never heard before, nor you can't play something that you have no clue what, how, how, to, how to use it. <laughs> like, you know, that, there's like people who try to play jazz, but then they don't listen to jazz. Or if you try to play R&B or country, but you've never listened to it. And just because you're a great musician and you can, you can in the moment adapt yourself, but stylistically people are going to know you don't listen to that just by, based off of what you're playing. Right. So that's why I'm stressing to listen to great rhythm section players. Listen, listen to great recordings with various styles. My third point is, and this is, this point is now the first two points were just kind of general that that can be applied to everybody. Um, but this third point is specifically for, drummers i'm going to start with the drummers play all tempos so learn how to play really slow get very comfortable with playing slow either with the sticks or with the brushes but ballads are one of the hardest things to play in jazz 
not up, not up tempos. Up tempos, those are easy. And I'm not saying that because I'm a professional now and I'm doing it. That, that's not the case. It is very hard to mentally engage in something that is so slow that your body is uncomfortable with how you're moving and how, how, the, how the feeling of it. It's uncomfortable. So you're like, and so now you're, you're anticipating like, oh, I got to do something. Nah, relax, relax. If you can play slow, if you can play at a ballot tempo, fast tempos will be easy for you. Right. So you want to make sure that you covering all all facets of, of tempos and not just just doing swing or medium. So you got to practice it all. And another way to learn how to play great tempos is play along with the recordings that you're listening to. OK, find a pick one song off of that recording. Find that, uh, you know, find a recording that is, is easier enough for you to like. Once you listen to it a few times, you can kind of pick up what the what the drummer's doing and then just shed with it. Just just practice along with the recording. And what happens is if my teacher used to tell me this all the time, if you can play along the recording at the tempo that they're playing it at, you won't have no problems on the bandstand with the people you play with in public. None, because your your brain now understands how to lock in where you are and stay there. And if you don't practice these things, when you get on a bandstand with new musicians, not people that, you're, that you play with often, but brand new people that you have no clue who they are, that's what sets you apart from everyone else who does not know how to do that. So play along with the recordings. Uh, my fourth part, my, my, uh, back to my third point, for the bass players, the same goes with you. Play along with the recordings, Okay. And if you hear on the record that they're playing a different style, then you stop, go back and listen. Don't play the instrument. Listen to what they're doing. Listen to what the bass player is doing. Almost transcribe exactly verbatim what they're using. So that way, if you get on a, if you get on a gig and you play a song in that style and they kind of change it up in that manner, you know how to adjust to it in real time. You can still play your own stuff, but now you stylistically know how to fit into that. And if the tempo changes, you know how to adjust what you're doing on bass to accommodate that tempo without losing the endurance, without losing the momentum, okay? Uh, point number four is be okay with practicing at uncomfortable tempos. Now, what I mean by that is there's an uncertainty that all musicians have when you play with people for the first time. There's an excitement that comes with that too, because I'm, I'm going to be able to create music with different people. I'm also going to be able to um, create uh, a musical moment, but then also you have cats who, if they've never heard you play before, they don't know what your tempo is like because everybody has their own internal clock. And that's what we teach in jazz band. We teach every we teach the ensemble about the eternal pulse. I actually learned that when I played in the bassy band. I learned about that internal pulse really quickly. As a matter of fact, I learned about it on my first gig with them. <laughs> and I realized I was the only one in the band who was slowing down. And thank God I love Scotty. He didn't kick me out, but he, you know, he did during the break, during after the first set, he said, Now you know. Now I need you to fix it. And he walked off. That was it. I knew I, I was because I was uncomfortable with them basic temp. If you play Whirly Bird, that's at least 275. Now, 275 is comfortable for me now. But back then, I couldn't get past at least 220. Like, not even close. Like, 220 was like Cherokee tempo, 230. That was like Cherokee tempo. But, man, these cats... It's like, whoo, whoo, okay. This is, whoo. You're like, you start to feel tense. And I had to practice in my practice room playing uncomfortable tempos. So I would set my metronome at like 315 and just hammer it out. And then I realized something, which gets to my next point which I, I figured out my next point by doing, by practicing uncomfortable tempos is rough. 
it's a term that I learned in college from my classical bass professor, Miss Punder. She used to always say, Brandon, you need the bruff. And I say, okay, well, I brushed my teeth this morning, so I assume that, yes, I'm good to go. She's like, no, that's not what I'm implying. Bruff means breathe, relax, and focus. If you do those three, you will never get tense during a performance. I said, okay, now she's a, she was my classical teacher. So when you play classical rep, it feels different. Tempos do vary, but they're not as intense or crazy as when you're playing jazz tempos, right? And I learned, like I, like I said, when I did that first set, with, when I got my first gig at the Basie Band, and I was struggling with them tempos. Finally, I said, you know what? I got to go back to my roots. I'm going to breathe. Just relax because I'm on the gig. So it's not like I got to worry about it anymore. I'm here. And let me just focus on making great music. Just focus on just doing the best that Brandon can do. I came back and everybody in the band after the gig was like, you finally figured it out, youngin. Young Buck, you figured it out. You, it clicked. We didn't, I'm glad we didn't have to tell you anything else than what we told you to for earlier. So what I learned, everybody, is you need to breathe. Bass and drummers, you need to breathe. You have to breathe. I can't tell you how many gigs I've been on with drummers that don't breathe. And I'll start to feel it. Because if we play something like we play Minority, Gigi Bryce, we play Minority, right? People sometimes like to call that tune fast. And I remember one time I played, we played that tune and this drummer, and he dropped not one, but four clicks under where, where the band leader. So we went, we're about right there. It, by the time we got to the saxophone solo, we were here. And it was obvious that I was trying to push it back, but that drummer did not have the endurance to keep it at that tempo. And he just was like, you know what? All of you are going to come to me. Now I'm going to tell you guys for, for, for the younger musicians, when you're playing with older musicians, please don't do that. They will be very upset with you. Matter of fact, they will call you out right there on the spot. I promise you it's not to embarrass you. They want to help you but they won't let that one slide. <laughs> they'll let a, they'll let a few, they will let a few wrong notes slide from the bass player. Like, oh, he kind of playing pitchy, but you know, his, 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 his intonation is kind of off, but he's still holding it down. But when you start to slow down from where the tempo was, yeah, they're going to say something, right? And in order to do that, you have to breathe. So use circular breathing, just as they teach wind players how to do. Rhythm section players have to do the same. Always have water on standby. Always hydrate yourself. Make sure you are drinking a lot of water. Not other stuff, water. <laughs> H2O, agua, right? You keep yourself hydrated because when you're playing and, you're, and once you start speeding up, you're burning calories, which means you're releasing a lot of sweat. So a lot of water is being expunged out of your body. And therefore, by the fifth song on the set, you are parched, both of you, <laughs> because now you are starting to become dehydrated. That has an effect on your muscles, especially for drummers. When you're dehydrated and you start to move like this, you're going to start cramping up. And eventually, it's going to feel it right here or somewhere right up in here. And then it's going to shoot all the way down to your hands where you're doing the most of this. So then now you have your whole entire forearm that's locked up. The same thing happens to bass players who don't drink water or stay hydrated. We're doing a lot of this. The first place you're going to feel it is in your left hand because your left hand is doing a lot of squeezing on the string. So when you're squeezing and you're doing this hard, you're doing this you, and you're not hydrated, this part of your arm starts to lock up. When that lock up, that's a problem. It, it's, it's bad for you because now your fingers are going to start getting cramped. So you're constantly, and I've seen bass players do this. They're like shaking their hand out because they're getting cramped because they're, it's starting to tense. You have to relax, okay? Fast tempos do not mean you, you stop breathing. You have to relax, okay? Also, 
to, to, to go on a keynote about the tempos as well. The faster you go, the smaller the beat becomes. The slower you play, the larger the beat becomes. So what I mean by that is when you're playing a ballad, you have a lot of space, which means you're thinking about the bigger beat uh, of, of, of each measure. So you have this one, two, three, four, right? And if you do like a medium swing, one, two, three, four, two, one, two. But when you're playing something like Cherokee or something or Giant Steps, I don't know, I'm just calling out the tunes that people just like to randomly make. They don't think that rhythm section players aren't tired. <laughs> and they would like to call the fastest song at the end. Um, you got to think about the bigger beat, which is one. One is your best friend. If you think about one, you will not get winded at all playing uh, up-tempo beat, up-tempos. So, for instance, if I'm doing one, 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 and I'm always thinking about one. I'm always making sure that my downbeat – has a stronger emphasis than the rest of the beats because it's moving so fast. I'm not thinking about one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, three. When you do that mentally, what happens, it's a psychological thing. It, you're, you're like tricking your body into saying, oh, oh, okay, yeah. And then you start to, then what happens is when you're relaxed, that's when you'll start to actually do a lot of the things that you want to do because now you're not thinking about filling in every single beat. You're just thinking about the bigger beat and everything else that comes afterward is just, that's in passing time. Okay. So I want to leave um, with my last, well, not necessarily with my last thought, but just the key signature here is this. When you listen, when you, when you're able to put together, when you're able to extract different styles from, from various types of genres, and I'm not even, I'll take jazz out of the picture for a second. I have done so many gigs where, you know, I would inter, intertwine other genres. Like I've, I remember doing an R and B gig and I played like a, a country blues line on bass. I was playing electric and the band leader turned around and looked at me. He said, I don't know what that is you playing, but man, keep playing that. That feels good. Now, I literally ripped that from a, a country singer, like band that I heard. And I just liked that bass line. I was like, man, it's a nice bass. And it had like kind of a, like a funk feel, but it was a country song. So I was like, oh, that's kind of hip. Right. And you, you kind of hear these different elements. So my, my best advice to, to the younger players is, it's good to learn it all, but if you're going to go that route, be very specific about what you're learning. Don't just try to cram a bunch of ideas and think that in the moment they're going to all come out. You have to be very deliberately like what you're deliberate, what you're doing, you know? So if I'm, and you always cater to the gigs, so if I'm doing an R and B gig, I'm going to make sure that I'm listening to music of that style so I know how I, I'm supposed to fit in. Otherwise, if I go into an R&B gig and I'm playing straight ahead swing bass lines, that's, it, it's not going to sound bad, but stylistic, stylistically, it's not form fitting. It's doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't apply. That doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't sound good. It just doesn't apply. And then in terms of tempos, like I said earlier, be okay with practicing at uncomfortable tempos because that's what's going to make you more comfortable when you do get a chance to play with people you've never played with before. So, um, yeah, I don't know if we wanted to open it up for questions or not, but, I mean, that's I think I've covered everything I got here. <laughs> what a, a great, great session, Brandon. Thank you so much. I don't see any questions right now in the chat feature, but we'll we'll see if any come in as I give some closing remarks. We've got these sessions scheduled into July, as I had mentioned uh, today. John O'Leary is going to be back with us at 430 for a, a session called How to Develop Rhythmic Ideas to Improvise Better on the Piano. And that, we, that John's sessions are always so great. Uh, Thursday this week, J.J. Padishaw is doing another guitar session, Jazz and Blues, Different Branches of the Same Tree. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you go to clearwaterjazz.com, 
the education page. You can see all these sessions. I'm excited for one. There's a young uh, saxophone player, Kyle Schroeder, who's been added on July 1st. He's doing a session called Aiming for a University Jazz Program, Tips from a College Student, Things to Consider and What to Expect. And uh, Kyle, someone that has grown up around uh, Clearwater Jazz Holiday and its programs, and he's doing great things. And so I know he's going to have a lot to share for high school students in particular who will want to go to uh, college and pursue their uh, career in music. So a lot of great things. And I also want to add from our education page, you can now click on what we are calling the studio. Clearwater Jazz Holidays Young Lions Jazz Master Virtual Sessions, the studio. And the studio will take you to all of these archived sessions. You can see the session recaps the recommended listening in many instances and now you can watch the full recorded sessions for free courtesy of Clearwater Jazz Holiday. Most of the full sessions will be up on the site within the next couple of weeks and so we're adding those slowly so session like today's you're going to be able to see uh, it's going to become a very uh, valuable resource for players of all ages and abilities so I'm really excited about that. Anyway, um, Brandon, it's been awesome, man. Uh, thank you for being part of this. Uh, we've got to get together so we can brainstorm about some other great topics, hopefully keep you around. And you, you also mentioned um, uh, quite a bit of uh, um, rhythm sections today. So if there are ideas you have for a playlist that you want to complement this session, if we want to throw some uh, examples of that, um, Maybe that's something we could do and add that to the, the studio. Oh, wait, you're, you're muted. Do I have to unmute you? Okay, there you go. Wait, I can't hear you. There we go. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I can definitely do that. Um, yeah, and I, I thought about that too. As, I, as we were talking, I said, oh, I could probably send him uh, some of those albums. So then that way they have an idea of what I'm referring to. So yeah, that's no problem. I can do that. All right. I, I think that's great. So we'll get that up there. And uh, we appreciate those of you that participated with us today. Hopefully you'll stick around for John O'Leary this afternoon and come back and see us. And Brandon, we'll see you next time. Um, everybody be well, stay safe and keep playing out there. All right. You guys take care. Thank you all for having me again.